Hi Bobcats! In this video, we are going to look at how you determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar. We have two objectives. The first is to classify an individual bond as polar or nonpolar, and the second is to classify an overall molecule as polar or nonpolar. A molecule is composed of several different bonds, and if those bonds arrange themselves perfectly symmetrically, uh, the molecule overall will be nonpolar because all of those polar bonds basically cancel out. So we're going to have to consider whether or not a molecule has polar bonds and then also how those polar bonds are arranged in three dimensions to classify a molecule as polar or nonpolar. Before we can determine if a molecule is polar, we have to determine if the bonds that are contained inside of that molecule are polar or not. I want to review this slide from much earlier in the chapter where we talked about pure covalent, polar covalent, and ionic bonding. Um, we want to focus on this part here with the polar bonding. And um, this will happen when you have two different nonmetals bonded to each other. And um, the, there's a difference in electronegativity between the atoms. And so one of the atoms pulls on the electrons more strongly than the other one does. And so those electrons get shifted over to one side. So the side that the electrons get, get shifted over to is going to be slightly negative because the electrons are spending more time there and the electrons are negative. The opposite end is going to be slightly positive. And so on this arrow notation, we put a little tick mark to make a plus at the uh, beginning of the arrow to indicate that that end of the bond is slightly positive. When we're looking at something like a Vesper structure or a Lewis structure, and we're trying to predict if the molecule is polar or nonpolar, we need to look at the individual bonds and see if any of the bonds are polar. And the easiest way to do that is right here. If we have two different nonmetals, the bond will be polar, with one exception. If the two atoms bonded to each other are carbon and hydrogen, it will be a nonpolar bond. The difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is so small that it is essentially a nonpolar bond. There's this, just this teeny tiny shift in the electrons, but it's so small that we would just consider the carbon hydrogen bond to be nonpolar. When we put together various bonds to build up an entire molecule, we need to consider how the uh, polar bonds that are present in that molecule interact with one another. Do they cancel each other out, which means that they're perfectly symmetrically arranged? Um, in that case, the overall molecule will be nonpolar. But if the arrangement of the bonds is asymmetric or not symmetric, then the molecule will be polar. So um, when we're trying to classify something as being a polar molecule, the first criteria we have to look at is that there has to be at least one polar bond. If all of the bonds in the molecule are nonpolar, then the molecule itself will be nonpolar. Then the second criteria we have to look at is um, if there's more than one polar bond present, the um, bonds have to be asymmetric for the overall molecule to be polar. If the molecule is perfectly symmetric, then the molecule will be nonpolar. So as an example, let's look at the oxides of carbon. So down here at the bottom, we have the Lewis structures for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. When we look at the carbon-oxygen bond, oxygen is much more electronegative, and so the electrons get shifted over in the direction of oxygen, making the oxygen end slightly negative and the carbon end slightly positive. So since carbon monoxide consists of just this one um, bond, one polar bond, the molecule overall is polar. There's nothing available to cancel it out. But if we take a look at carbon dioxide, which is over here on the other side, the uh, carbon-oxygen double bond will pull the electrons towards the oxygen as a polar bond, 
And there's also another carbon-oxygen double bond on the other side of the molecule. These bond dipoles are equal and opposite. They are pointed, they, they are just simply diametrically opposed to one another. And so that polarity cancels out. And overall, this is a nonpolar molecule. Notice how symmetric this molecule is. Um, we have that C double bond O to the right and the C double bond O to the left. Um, it's like there's a mirror plane there reflecting the left side of the molecule onto the right side of the molecule. And that makes the bond dipoles cancel out. This diagram is showing how um, in some different molecules the, that have the same electron geometry, they're all tetrahedral, um, how in one case um, the bonds cancel out, but in the other two cases the presence of a lone pair means that the uh, bond dipoles can't cancel out because the uh, lone pair is different than the, the polar bonds, and so we end up with polar molecules overall. Uh, we have methane, ammonia, and water for our three molecules. The top row of uh, of diagrams is showing the um, the vesper structures tetrahedral with the um, molecular shape being tetrahedral for methane, trigonal pyramidal for ammonia, and bent for water. And then the next row is showing the arrow notation for the bond dipoles. Um, notice in water, we have a bond dipole up that points up and to the right. We have another one that points up and to the left. So the left and the right parts can cancel out, but both of them are pointing up. And so those components simply add together, making water a polar molecule. You can see that in the bottom diagram, um, the shading of this electron density map indicates that the oxygen end is slightly negative, that's where the, the red color is, and the hydrogen end is slightly positive, that's where the blue color is. The electrons are not distributed evenly, this is a polar molecule. If we look at ammonia in the middle, we also have a polar molecule. The uh, horizontal components of the bond dipoles cancel out, but all three of those bond dipoles are pointing up. So we have an overall bond dipole and pointing up, or overall molecular dipole pointing up. Um, when we look at this electron density map, um, the negative end is up here where that lone pair on the nitrogen is, and then the three hydrogens are slightly uh, positive, making this a polar molecule overall. Then if we look at methane, um, they're indicating just this teeny tiny, almost imperceptible uh, bond dipole between hydrogen and carbon. We're going to just pretend in all other cases that the carbon-hydrogen bond is completely nonpolar. But the symmetry of a tetrahedron means that all four of these bond dipoles, since they are equal in size, are going to cancel out. And if you want to go and do the vector math on this and come up with a vector to represent each one of these uh, bond dipoles and then do the math to add them all up, you'll find that they add up to zero. And that's reflected in this electron density map showing um, that the electrons are very, very evenly distributed in methane. So how do we actually determine if a molecule is a polar molecule or not? Well, start with this question. It, do you have at least one polar bond or at least one lone pair on the central atom? If the answer is no to both questions, then we have a nonpolar molecule. If the answer is yes, then we have another question to consider. Look at that central atom. Are all of the electron domains on that central atom identical? Are they all exactly the same? Are they all a carbon-fluorine single bond? And they're all exactly the same. If the answer is yes, they are all exactly the same, then it is a nonpolar molecule. But if the answer is no, you have three carbon-fluorine bonds, but you have one carbon-chlorine bond, so that they are not all exactly the same, then you will have a polar molecule. Additionally, if one of those domains is a lone pair and all the rest are bonding pairs, 
they are not all identical, and so that will make a polar molecule as well. Let's start over here on the nonpolar side and look at a bunch of examples of molecules that are going to be nonpolar. In the, uh, the first two molecules that are drawn here, we have a central carbon atom, and then all four positions around it are halogen. The first one is the Lewis structure, and then the second one is the Vesper structure. Since all four of those bonds are exactly the same, this is going to be a nonpolar molecule. It's perfectly symmetric. I want to compare and contrast that with this molecule over here that's in the polar group. Uh, yes, there are four single bonds around the central carbon, but the other atom that's part of the single bond is different. And so the fact that, that we have um, four domains, they're all single bonds, but they're not all single bonds to the same thing, that's going to make this a polar molecule since they are not exactly identical. When we look in the nonpolar side at the three remaining molecules, every bond in these three remaining molecules is nonpolar because it is either a carbon-carbon bond or it's a carbon-hydrogen bond. And we treat all of those bonds as being nonpolar. So if every bond in the molecule is nonpolar, the molecule has to be nonpolar. In the other structures over here on the left, the molecules that have lone pairs are going to be asymmetric, and so they will be uh, polar, that is, lone pairs on the central atom. When you start getting to bigger, more complicated molecules, um, generally there will be one piece of the molecule that makes the molecule uh, polar. So for instance, on this bottom left molecule, the uh, oxygen is what's going to make this polar. We've got um, the, this carbon here uh, bonded to an oxygen, bonded to a hydrogen. Whether you focus on the oxygen or the carbon, you're going to end up with the conclusion that the uh, molecule is polar. Um, in this uh, next molecule, this is uh, acetone. Um, this central carbon right here makes the molecule polar with that C double bond O being a very polar bond. And then the carbon has three domains. Two of them are the same, but one is different. So it's a polar molecule. And then down here in methanol, the last molecule, um, the uh, if you look at the carbon atom, three of the domains are the same, but one is different, the one that's the CO bond, and so that makes this a polar molecule. In looking at this series of molecules, um, starting on the far left where we have the carbon bonded to four fluorines, all four domains on that carbon atom are exactly the same, and so it will be nonpolar. If we move to the next molecule, we have a carbon-chlorine single bond and three carbon-fluorine single bonds. So even though they're all single bonds, that outside atom is different for one of them, and that asymmetry is enough to make this a polar molecule. In the case of the next molecule, we have two distinct types of domains, the carbon-chlorine single bond and the carbon-fluorine single bond. That's going to make this molecule polar. Um, in looking at this next case, we've added one more chlorine. Um, so we still have an asymmetric molecule because there is still a uh, carbon-fluorine bond left. And then finally, when we've replaced all of the fluorines so that they are all chlorines, um, now all four domains are exactly the same, making this modified molecule finally nonpolar. The main reason we're studying uh, whether a molecule is polar or not is because um, polar molecules will behave differently than nonpolar non molecules. And just as an example, the red oxygen end of the water molecule is slightly negative, whereas the white hydrogen end is slightly positive. So in this first arrangement, we have negative end of one molecule interacting with the positive end of the next, and opposite charges attract. But in that second arrangement, we have the positive hydrogens pointed towards each other, and um, light charges repel. So the best arrangement of the, these molecules will be the first one, opposites attract. For additional practice, take a look at all the Lewis and Vesper structures we've drawn and see if they are polar molecules or not.